start the record. <clears throat> I'm here with A. Martinez. Hey. Yeah, I, like I was, um, you know, I'm always looking for stories to do, and I and I remember us talking years ago about that movie Cowboys, the Cowboys. It was the Cowboys. There's a new one out called Cowboys, which is uh, transgender. <laughs> <laughs> so you all things have changed from 1972, but um, what, what uh, state of mind were you in? And uh, were you in Los Angeles at the time when the call came or how, how did you get the gig? Yeah, it was that uh, dude, uh, uh, Lynn Stormaster. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah, you remember him, right, Gary? He I was, do. Yeah, such a kind, kind man, like a, a really... Uh, I really, uh, I really liked that guy. And he, he got me up for, for the Cowboys. He got me in the room, you know, with uh, Mark Rydell. Turns out that they didn't want me. They wanted uh, uh, some other kid and, um, and they hired the other kid. And then uh, uh, that kid uh, couldn't, couldn't cut it on the horse. You know, he, we, all the actors, half the kids in the cast were rodeo kids. Half of them were actors and all the actors had to go to rodeo school. And the kid washed out on the horse. And so I heard this through the grapevine. I'm thinking, wow, they're gonna they're gonna call me up now, maybe. And then they called up another kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that kid uh had the bad uh the bad uh, luck of doing something stupid and um got thrown in jail. So uh so then they finally they finally decided to give me a shot, <laughs> like you know, like uh, by just because there was so many um, losses in front of me, so I got it, and uh, it was it was such a great experience, man. I was I couldn't believe it actually. You know, my my daddy used to take us all to the drive-in to see all the John Wayne movies, and uh, it was just such a trip to be there and have him be there in real life. You know, it's like I told this story a few times, but I I always felt like a kid in my pajamas around him. You know, because we at the at the drive in, we would always fall asleep on the way home. My parents got got wise to our tricks. So they started making us wear our pajamas to the drive in so they wouldn't have to put them on when we got home. So. Um, so, you know, you're in, at the drive in in your pajamas and you're sneaking in at the snack bar at intermission, hoping your nobody from school sees you and stuff. And anyway, it was just it was like John Wayne and I'm this little kid. It was really really amazing experience of being uh, overwhelmed by his star power. And I thought he did a really nice job in the movie too. Yeah, he did. It's interesting to know that all those kids were uh, actually rodeo kids, eh? Yeah, yeah, a lot of really good ones. In fact, the one who played the little teeny kid, this guy, uh, Clay O'Brien, I forget the name of that character, the little teeny kid, but uh, the one where they he couldn't fit up to the, the line on the chalkboard. Right. And so the the his his pals pulled the books out from under the chalkboard so that he would fit. And that guy Clay O'Brien went on to become a champion, rodeo champion, more than one time. You know, great, great uh, rodeo guy. Good story. Also, Bruce Dern. Remember Bruce Dern in there? Oh yeah, I mean, and the bad guy. Oh yeah, he just said, was that his first like. Because from then on, it was Bruce Dern doing the bad guys, right? The bad guy, yeah. And, and uh, I'm, the story goes that uh, John Wayne told him, uh, boy, people going to hate you after this. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, And they sort of did. I, I met him. Uh, I saw him again. Um, I think it, Warner Brothers did a 35th anniversary uh, DVD interviewing the cast and stuff. And I just got the sense of talking to him that he really felt that that it it hurt his career to have done that that you know that you know killing john wayne was just made him so he he said literally he got death threats so so i don't know you know but um yeah it was great i'll tell you one thing i'll say for sure he he was a uh, you know how it is you go you get to do these jobs and you get to go see all these people you know and watch them work and uh, you know you've been studying how to do it and, going to school to figure it out. And then you meet these certain actors and you just go, wow. And I, I remember looking at him going, okay, this is a whole different thing he's doing. So I, I made it my business to be on the set whenever he was working. And there was this one day where he's, he's gonna, he's putting a rope around 
Roscoe Lee Brown's neck, you know, going to lynch him, you know, when we, when the kids caught up to him and try to get the, get the cattle back. And, um, and I'm watching and he starts ranting, ranting and yelling at Roscoe. And I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm thinking that ain't in the script, you know, and, and then they do take two and he does a whole other rant and that different from the first one is just making stuff up off the top of his head. And I'm looking around and there's Mark Rydell and he's just smiling and bobbing his head. And I'm thinking, well, they don't care if the guy says the words in the script. <laughs> 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 they just want this dude to be scary. And, and, and that was like a lesson, like, oh, oh, I get it. So they're, they're hiring us to play characters, not to um, necessarily just say the words. That was a, that was a, That's a good story. Yeah, a good one. I mean, the, the cast in this thing, I mean, the, well, that Moses Gunn, he was interesting for his time. Yeah, yeah, amazing guy, Moses Gunn. But was that in the series or was that the movie? Uh, that was the series. Moses. Yeah, was Moses the was the series guy. Yeah, he was real tall, I remember. And Roscoe was, was really short. Roscoe, um, Lee Brown, uh, he passed on, actually. He passed on right when we were doing that video, actually. He, he did not make himself available. He was ill. But, uh, you know, that dude is a poet amazing poet and he was a world-class athlete when he was young and john wayne and and roscoe would play chess in the mornings uh, you know bef before makeup and stuff and and i do re recall that um during the course of the shoot uh john wayne he did this infamous I interview in playboy magazine where you know the vodka was flowing and uh and eventually he started talking about the supremacy of white people over people of color and i just you know it's like that came out on the on a weekend when we were out there and i noticed that the the monday after that interview roscoe declined to play chess with him that day and i don't know if they ever picked it up again but it was such a uh you know like a <laughs> it was just <laughs> so unfortunate or maybe fortunate that he uh, that he said all that stuff, you know, uh, you know, it's just he sort of let the cat out of the bag in terms of his uh, his feelings in that regard. It's funny, too, because he's married to a, a Mexican woman, you know, so you kind of think, what is that? You know, why? Why would you why would you be like that? You know, but I, I got to say he did good stuff for me, man. He taught me, uh, he taught me a lot about how to fight for the movies and make it look, make it look good for the movies instead of like the way you learn when you're on the street and you had to defend your little brother, stuff like that. So I was, I, I, it was a great experience getting to do it. I'll say that. I mean, I, I can, I mean, the chance, I mean, it was Slim Pickens, Richard, I, you know, Richard Farnsworth. I don't know if you, remember him but he was a, originally like a stunt guy who turned to be an actor right and yeah you know in fact i think that was the, his it might have been uh i can't say for sure but it might have been his, one of his calling cards my character actually killed him there was a trick that we did where when we were, we were fooling the bad guys they had uh, my character hang on the saddle horn and like just like be on the side of my horse so it looked like my horse was like uh riderless and and Farnsworth had the, the nicest face of all the bad guys. He was the only one that had a kind looking face in my estimation. All those other guys were mean, mean ass looking, you know, you know, grizzled guys and stuff. And he had that kind of wide eyed thing. And he, he comes up to my, my horse and reaches over to see what's going on. And I, I, I spring up behind the side of the horse and they, I had one of these big long uh, knives that was a retractable, uh, you know, stunt knife. And I just stuck it into his gut and then give it a give it a, a turn like that. And in the score, John Williams uh, actually did a did a like an extra hit when I when I turned it in his gut. So it was like this horribly gross kind of moment. But I dispatched him, not me, but my character. And then he ended up doing that movie with Jane Fonda and uh, and Redford. Uh, Electric Horseman, maybe, or something. Maru, he was mm -hmm. a star. He was a star of that movie. I know. I remember this Canadian film he made with uh, an actress. I can't think of her name now, but he, he was amazing in it. it. It won all the awards back then. Yeah, he's an amazing actor, that dude. Amazing guy. And then Colleen Dewhurst. You had a whole, 
all those scenes with her, that must have been interesting. She was from Montreal, I found. Right. And she was, if I'm not mistaken, she was uh, uh, together with George C. Scott for a while, too. And, uh, and George C. Scott was the actor that supposedly Rydell was picturing to do that movie when he first got the gig. Um, but you know, I think Warner Brothers said, "No, nah, you got, you got, you have a chance to get John Wayne. You should use John Wayne." And John Wayne wanted the gig. In fact, there's a quote that says it from him saying that that was the most wonderful experience of his career. And I don't know if that's true or not. It's hard to believe that with all the John Ford movies and stuff. But but he did uh, he did say it, and it was interesting. There was you know because John Wayne was making all those movies back in the day where he was he had his own company, you know, Bat Jack, I think it was called. He had his own director and his own crew and he was like the guy, you know, and so suddenly there's Rydell and um, I remember the, uh, there was a moment where there was like a sort of a, a like a, they butted heads a little bit over whether or not we're going to do this one scene over again and Rydell said he got home to his hotel that night and there was a message that the Duke wanted him to, to said call me and he thought oh man, you know, now I've got trouble. But it wasn't trouble at all. It was respect. It was like uh, for the first time, the Duke um, saying, "Come over and let's have dinner together tonight." Tonight, so it was this interesting uh, experience. One of the things that I think got all those great actors such, attached to it is the fact that Rydell was so respected. You know, he went on to be like a big, uh, big wheel at the actor studio out here in L.A. and stuff, and you know, did a lot of great movies. That dude. And then that Robert Carradine, was he the father of all the Carradine? He was the, he was the, I think he might've been the youngest brother, I think. Uh, I think, uh, was the older Carradine named Robert too? Maybe he was, yeah. I, I thought it was David. It was David, David was the oldest and then Keith was in there. And then uh, I think those were the three that main, mainly had acting careers and then Bobby. And in fact, Bobby, Robert or Bobby, he, he was living with David. And David couldn't come out to be on location. So David asked me to be his guardian. So even though I was like 22, uh, I think Bobby was like 17 or so. Maybe I was 21, but I ended up being his guardian on that show. And I had responsibility for his, you know, for keeping him morally pure and everything. And I tried to do the best I could, Gary. That's all I could say. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you actually... I mean, I, I just suspected you you shot mostly around, where was it, Santa Barbara they shot or up in there? Or was, did you actually come to New Mexico? Oh, no, we shot, it, it was, we did the last two weeks, in, we did at Warner Brothers. Uh, there was three different stages in Warner Brothers. Beautiful things where they set out the campsite, you know, the midnight campsite. So beautiful. Where Bobby Carradine was playing the guitar and, and it, bro it broke into the score where they're playing this Vivaldi concerto and it was like exquisite but but most of the movie was shot in uh, in New Mexico and a little bit in Colorado I remember they went they were in Pagosa Springs for a while and they went up to uh, Durango that was the place I remember for, for being the most beautiful place I I ever had seen at that moment in my life we're up in up super high in the mountains of Colorado and we're you know, it was around the place where we were going to bury him. And so we're like, we're up there and we're looking around and there's this giant, the, the mountain falls into this gorge and then it goes back up on the other side of the, of, of the hill, you know, across from you. And on the hill that's facing us, the mountain that's facing us, there's this springtime. There was uh, four distinct colors of, of, uh, of green in the trees, the various trees. And they were just, they were just like interspersed all random on the thing. And it was all just this flowy thing where whoever, this strain of tree did this and this strain did that and stuff. And there was, but there were four vivid, vividly different kinds of green, just boom. And I remember just like looking at that and like having like this wave of consciousness change where you just get so overwhelmed with beauty that you, you, you don't remember where you are for a minute. So beautiful, Durango, Colorado. And then we shot, there was a, one of those shots out, out in Lamy near where you were, you were living for a while out there. Um, San, San Cristobal, I think, ranch maybe, is that yeah. one? 
It's yeah. still there. Huge. You know, that, yeah. And I think that's where we shot. I was looking at pictures trying to figure out where we shot what. And I think that's where we shot the end of the cattle drive when the, the kids all drive the, the, the uh, cattle into, into market. And uh, now, now we've gone through life and death and we're all like stern and like we're like men little men now instead of just kids and then i think the eaves ranch is where they built the uh the spread of the of john wayne's character and his wife it's great though man i heard stories about people going out there who were in the cast going out there later and uh you know trying to you know get that feeling of the place but apparently time has been pretty hard on it <laughs> you know on eaves ranch yeah, on the place they built for that, then they built like a cabin for him or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it though, man. It was like uh, as a dream, dream job, you know, to to uh, to be able to do something like that. It's like you know, like the first time in my life I ever thought, wow, you know, more 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 is possible than I had imagined. It was a good. Good yeah, moment. it was a good kick to your career in a way, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I I uh, I was so stoked about it, you know, that that I told my agent at the time. I said, uh, "Listen, I, I much prefer to be on the, in the movies than on these TV shows," and because um, we got you know sixteen weeks on location, you know. I, I said, so I'd like to just be in movies now. So like a year later, <laughs> when I had not worked, <laughs> I, did. I tried out for a Richard Widmark movie that I, that they actually tested me for it. But Fred Frederick Forrest got that part. And then later when I went to see the movie, I went, well, no wonder he got the part. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the dude, you know, he was acting on a whole other level from me and uh, so I had to go back to being TV to like get, go back into my training, but it's funny, you know, Mark Rydell was, uh, had been an actor himself. He'd done soaps in New York. He was also a, a musician, you know, always when you meet the musicians, they have the thicker brains. Um, it's like the dude, the dude, when you're struggling, he just like, he wouldn't say much. And then he'd just walk up and just whisper like, you know, few words just whisper them into your ear just between you and him just a simple sentence and like boom the lights would go on and so i'd be back on some set of the streets of san francisco or something the next year and i'd be like on the sitting there on the scene going why is this scene dying what's wrong my what's wrong with the scene and i literally started trying to imagine uh mark Rydell trying to conjure him and think what, what would he say to me right now this to save me but i never could get him to show up yeah, yeah. no it's so true you you look uh, that's really what directing is about just open your eyes to something you're not thinking about or seeing and mm. yeah it's so subtle sometimes yeah yeah all right yeah i think we talked about everything i needed to talk about you're a great guest, and we should have you on the show. Like we have a regular guest. Uh, we're, we're only eight weeks in, so we'll wait till we build up some ratings, and we'll bring you back for. A... You got anything going? You, you cool. Gotta... Yeah. Well, I just finished this gig. Uh, I got a couple of things. You know that feeling when you got something that you did and it's not out yet. You know how that how that feels. Great. Yeah, I know. You know, it's bad when you don't have that. <laughs> Because when you don't have that, it's like, oh, well, it's possible. It's possible my output is like done. Yeah. But but you know, it's like I got I got I got to go to New Zealand last year to do this gig for Netflix. You know, and they don't want me to talk about it, it's that kind of thing. But right. it's it was super super um, interesting part, like nothing I've ever played before. And I had heard uh, I had heard that this guy who wrote it was was thinking of me for this part. I heard it like a year and a half beforehand, you know? And, you know, over the course of the years, once in a while you hear something like that, somebody has got you in mind for something really cool. And, you know, usually it never, it never happens. And uh, for me, and, uh, but somehow the dude just, he meant it. He called me up, he called my agents up and says, hey, we, I'm offering him this gig on this show. It's like episode nine of these, these 10, uh, 10 episodes, but it's just the coolest thing, man. It's just so 
creative and smart and uh and and he really he wrote it for me and uh and i didn't screw it up you know so he came to me afterwards he said man i you're making me look real smart you know that you did such a good job with this so that made me happy yeah and, and then i got this one gig on a uh on a Michael Bay movie that's shooting that just finished right just last couple of weeks uh, were Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Yaya and uh, Aiza Gonzalez and uh, Moses Ingram and a lot of cool, you know, really cool people. And, you know, it's, I didn't have, it's not a big part, but it was a, it was a good part. So I, I got a couple of things I did, you know, and yeah, I feel relieved, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Was you working on that Yellowstone? Never did work on that. No, it's over now, is it? No, I don't know. I I'm not sure. I keep up with it enough to know. You know. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say, "Oh, you should be on that show and stuff," but um. Oh yeah, I've yeah. never watched it. Yeah, I auditioned for it too, but. Mm. You know, got a lot of criticism, I guess, from Adam about stuff. Oh really? Well, I guess they cast that Asian girl. Originally for that one that got raped in the wind. What was that? You had a title, same name. Born it born to the wind? No, remember Graham was in that it won an academy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um yeah, uh, uh Wind River. So I just figured there ain't no Indian girl wants to get raped. So that's why they didn't sign up. So they hired that girl. I I don't know, that's what I thought. Mm. But Adam took offense to that and thought, you know, an Indian girl should have had that part. And then when he did the series, he brought the, I guess she's Asian or something, into the show that. too to play the main native girl. And mm. That got all twisted up in a knot. <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll have to bring you up and do Resident Alien or... Oh it's man, I, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah, that I'm dude. Is so funny, man. He's so funny. That dude. He's like, it's like he's you know he's got some something other thing going on. That who Alan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Sure. Come on, now, man. That guy. What the hell is that? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really coming along nicely. He's a pretty cool guy. Well, he's pretty, you know, very uh, concentrated. Mm. You can't really hang out with him much. Or... Mm. But that's cool. Mm. Yeah. It's a great cast, though. We all get along. And we do this little radio. That's where I started doing this stuff, really. I mean, yeah. I've always loved radio. But we start doing a radio show because we're all in quarantine there uh, last time. <laughs> And uh, we started doing radio, kind of daily radio cast, and I would produce little segments for it, and and people would suggest music, and then that's how we got a lot of diverse music, because Chris used to listen to it, and uh -huh. I'd start bringing Indian tunes in, and, and oh. get it on the air, and then Chris thought, hey, I like that song, and he put it in the show, you know? Oh. Oh, that's cool. So now I'm trying to get, like, I'm going to go get Derek's, you know, my guitar, Derek Miller from my community. I'm going to go get all his, he's got a whole library of music. The send it to Chris, even get some Derek, some gigs in the sphere. Sweet, sweet. When you're on the set, do they, uh, do they like uh, make you put a mask on the minute you finish talking kind of thing? Yeah, we shot in September because that's when we went back. We went down March 11th, like everybody. And then, uh, yeah, we had to go through all kinds of shit. I had to quarantine for two weeks in Canada. I mean, I'm surprised they let everybody in. Mm. They shut it down more tight after we did that. Mm. And um, uh, yeah, but we're going back. Money can buy you in to shoot. But yeah, they, they do all the, I don't know if it's a daily test. The nurse comes to your bedroom there uh, or hotel room. Gives you a thermometer and puts the thing on your head. They test you and then they test you when you get the set for the instant test. And I mean, I worked in LA just in November. They kind of were doing that too, you know. They were pretty efficient with that testing, especially we had like shit. We were in, uh, you know, whatever there, just in uh, the valley, just to start the valley. What do you call it? Uh, Studio City. Hmm. some abandoned homeless lot 
of mall and we must have had 200 people out there mm. you know <laughs> this seemed pretty risky it's for that rutherford falls oh oh yeah 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 that's coming out it had all kinds of indie control in that day like Wow. All the top showrunner was a Navajo girl. I was like, wow, this is fucking trippy. I know. Yeah. Wow. So that's it's really good. changing all that stuff. That's so good. I know. I had a hard time uh, getting, you know, I just, every time I'm doing this, this last thing with uh, Michael Bay, I, every time I, I just finished, you know, I want to talk about it because it's like, I'm learning, you know, it's like every time you do the scene is like, you feel with me, it's like, Oh, I just, a new thing comes every time I do it. Uh, but there's somebody, you know, where's your mask. And I kept forgetting, you know, there was no place to put it. I had to go hide it under some papers or something. So I was constantly having to, to uh to you know and i understand why and i'm glad we did it but it, it really i i it started to drive me crazy like the fact that in one single day i must have had i must have been told where's your mask or given a new mask 50 times and you know and i'm just trying to figure stuff out and think of stuff and i want to like figure out what's going on with the other actors and it was really uh, the first time that I really thought, wow, this is this makes it harder than it. Than oh, it, yeah. You got to keep your mask on to your scene. They kind of tell you when to take it off. Right. And then you got to put it back on again. So that's why you just end up racing to your room because you can take your mask off. You take know? your mask off. And, and, and plus, you know, it's it, you know, and I and I, I I'm so grateful that that, you know, so many of the people around here have been willing to wear masks. A lot of them haven't. And that's been. It's amazing to see some of your neighbors just like going, I ain't doing it, you know, and just think, wow, really, man, you're, you're, you're not, not going to do this. And I got my family here. It's just shocking to me, yeah. but, but, you know, when you're, when you're in the thing and you're working with these actors and stuff and you did a thing and you want to like communicate with them. And the, and the first thing that happens is their face goes away. It's like, what what is going on with your face it's like you realize you, you take those cues you know for you gotta read the eyes then you know you, you gotta, gotta read the eyes <laughs> i know <laughs> i want to see if you're smiling though man <laughs> yeah i know but you know all good all good so yeah, yeah. so grateful that we're gonna we're gonna be okay i think yeah i think so did you get the the shot yet sure, sure did i got oh, what you did I got Moderna, uh, went to Dodger Stadium, you know, where I've gone so many times in my life, man. Uh -huh. Had so many great experiences. At Dodger. In fact, I met Leslie because of Dodger Stadium. I went to Dodger Stadium the night that Sandy Koufax threw his perfect game, September 9, 1965. And I mean, and then years later, uh, I get this, some from a, a guy at AFI wrote a script uh you know it's like american film institute so that nobody yeah. gets if you're an actor but in the script the character that they offered offered me was riding in a, in his in a pickup truck with his father and they were talking about watching sandy koufax pitch and i'm thinking there's no money and i'm in the and i'm losing my house and i'm having to like fix it to give all give the money of my house to like this woman that i broke up with and i, I and my brother and me are, he's he's helping me we're so this mar this is no this is uh linda pacino oh. and uh and so I, I well i can't do this but i showed it to my brother and he goes oh man well you gotta do that i go well man you know we're, we're sitting here eating jack in the box three times a day just we're, we're so strung out and and uh he goes well if you don't do this part man and talk about Kofax like this somebody else is going to get to do it just think how it's going to make you feel so I thought, I thought what a brother anyway so I did the movie and then um the first day of the movie I'm walking to the set and uh, I see this woman like like about 50 yards in front of me we're walking up a sidewalk and she's going to turn then to the left and go into the into the little house and her and her hair is bouncing like this you know and then she turns and she's got t-shirt and jeans and uh, white socks under her sand uh, under her sandals i think that's a trip she had the white socks on because she just had gotten toe surgery and she didn't want to do the gig but the director forced her to do it because he was crushing on her so bad 
So she did the gig, even though she had a good reason not to. And I did the gig, even though I had a good reason not to. And now, you know, 40 years later, we're married and three kids, you know. So Dodger Stadium, you know, Sandy Koufax, you know, it's like he like provoked the the, the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Wow. So that's where I went to get the COVID vaccine. Uh, you know, they, they shot the Moderna. Did you go together? Or? Uh, yeah, we did. Cool. And uh, and then the second time we had to we had to go separate the second time. But yeah, we got it. Have you got it yet? Yeah, I got the Johnson and Johnson. Cool. Yeah. Well, when did you get it? Hmm? When did you get it? Uh, it'll be two weeks tomorrow. So I'm, you know. Good, good, good. Did you have any reaction to it? Yeah, I did. I I got a shortness of breath. Woke up with a fright and mm. little chills and stuff. I don't know. I didn't feel good. I had to go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, they say, oh, the girl told me, make sure you work your arm. So <coughs> this uh, new place we got here, I've been uh, loading sand. I want to make a beach in the back because it's all, you know, they put carpet down and wood chips. And rather than pick all that up, I'm just putting sand down on top of it and make a beach. Cool. And so I started hauling sand with my arm right away, you know. So the, the pain went right away from hauling sand, but I was pretty achy and grumpy by the end of the night. Yeah, no, it's definitely, you can feel that your body is really being yeah. challenged. Yeah. 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 But I felt uh, grateful. I'm pretty happy with the shot I got, you know, even though it's only 60 some percent or something. Yeah, but it's supposed to be um, good equally the, good for the for the serious issue, you know. It's the serious one that you, you know, it's like that serious version of it that you don't want to deal with. We had a, we had a guy in our band and uh, so funny, man, his girlfriend had to go in the hospital and get some procedure done, you know, and they're both, you know, they're not young and, and they didn't want to, she, he talked her into coming home and getting the, uh, the rehab from the operation done at home. So she wouldn't be exposed to COVID. And wouldn't, you know, one of the, uh, physical therapists that came to do her rehab had it and gave it to both of them and it killed him quick wow. and, you know and i mean you know you just i got another friend in san diego who got so sick with it and just almost lost almost lost so you know it feels great to have a little insurance against it now i'll say that yeah a little yeah. something we can get back to work no man yeah well i miss you man it's good yeah. to talk to you good to see you man we'll do one more uh, together someplace somehow yep i'm uh, i'm keeping it in mind and um and you know i'm i got this thing i'm trying to get set up that's that right it would have a cool thing for you in there that's give give us a chance to finally sort of loop back around to doing something together but but more like doing really cool stuff, uh, you know, standing. Oh, do you know that cat, Brascom Richmond? Mm, I don't know him, no. I don't really know him. He's a lot of native parts, and he got it from Hawaii, or he lives in Hawaii. Yeah. Kind of a stunt man who, you know, he did some series I can't think of, but I thought you might have come across him for over the years. He's been around forever. Yeah, I know, I know of him, but I never actually bumped into him. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of a funny cat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did, very did, rash, did, very kind of rashy dude. Mm. But, uh, we did this little low budget thing for uh, some native director out of Hollywood uh, using uh, Colorado River tribes money, and uh, you know I. I was having a really hard time that time last I was out there living in my van and shit and during the breakup and all that. And hmm. I got this little gig. It, I, I think I worked them up to 300 bucks or something. And I couldn't do the lead because it was some, you know, I don't know the reason why I couldn't. And I said, well, you know, if there's anything else. And he gave me the kind of, you know, third or fourth part. And he managed to get Brascom to do the main, the part I was supposed to play. And he, he did it really well. Like he's this perfect for that part. Mm. My part's really fucked up guy, you know? 
but it was fun. What's it called? Uh, it's about a country singer girl. Hmm. She ends up showing me her tits in the short. It was really funny. <laughs> I can't think of it now. Well, I look for, I Kyla look. Garcia was that girl. She's really cool. Kyla Garcia is the actress. Uh, mm. It was called uh, Blackwater. Oh, okay. Yeah, I played at Slam Dance and a few other spots. But cool. Anyway, I thought uh, you might have known him from over the years. No, I just, uh, I just. Uh, I got you know a couple of ideas about uh, who to go to for help, you know. But um, I'm trying to be real careful, you know. I'm I'm probably just scared as all it is really. For, but, uh, for the money, you mean? Or? No, just like to to help with you know the vision of it and the the idea of you know trying to write it out, you know. Um, I think the thing about it that most uh, is is complicating is that you know I got this idea that it starts. You know, it starts in a certain locale, sort of focused in in a certain world, but then it gets it, it gets pulled into another place. You know, it, it starts here, but it ends up going there. So it's not a simple thing to explain. And you know, my manager said, "Well, you gotta you gotta explain that." And he said, "What well, really? What you gotta do is you gotta write you gotta write an episode that's set in the other location, so we can see what the two worlds are like if you're gonna pitch two worlds." So I did that. But of course, the problem with doing that is that, you know, you have this world and it's, you know, there's a lot of people in it. And then when you, when you write episode two and you find a way to jump to the other world, which really wouldn't happen all at once in, in, if you really were doing the show, suddenly there's the, all these other people in this world. So now you got all these people and all these people and it turns into a shit ton of people. And, um, and uh, that's always been his beef with me is why do you write these things that have so many people in them? You know, it's like, I said, well, that's the cut. That's the way I grew up. So that's, you know, what I value. And um, uh, Have you seen that? Uh, what's that girl you worked with? Cassidy Freeman? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen her new show? That gemstones show? Yeah. N no, I haven't seen it. How is that? Fuck. Check it out. Yeah. That's drippy. Okay, that's uh, what's that guy's name? That uh, Danny McBride. Danny McBride, yeah, I love that dude. Yeah, yeah, you'll love this show then. And Goodman, you know, he's oh, yeah, perfect gig for him. But... Cool, yeah, I'll check that out. I've been meaning to, yeah, it's uh, worth I love her. She's a, she's an amazing person, yeah, she is. She just lives around the corner here now. Oh, cool, she's just the, right be the next street over is uh, Spruce. Oh, she wow. Bought a house there. Well, uh, good for her. Moved out of LA, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. did so did the guy Bailey, the guy who played Branch at, in Longmire. He moved to North Carolina with his family. Mm. You know, a lot a lot of people doing that. A lot of people I know actually leaving leaving California. Um, I heard that Australian guy is coming back. What's his name? Rob Taylor. Yeah, I seen him tweet something that he's on. A, you know, like he's going back to some place to shoot. He didn't say place. what though, right? He no, was, he's very vague. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. Everyone is like asking me, "Oh, so is is something happening?" <laughs> so I, <laughs> I'd be the last to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's cool. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Well, man. Um, have a good rest of your day, brother. Thank you. Give my best to Les, and we'll see you guys soon. I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please let us know if you're going to be in town, man. We got a little more space now. We can. Yeah. Cool. Uh, give you a shelter if you need it. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Sleep outside now. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, when is this going to be on, man? Uh, I'll let you know. It's going to be in April. Okay, well, just let me know so I can make a noise about it. Yeah, it might be with the Dennis Hopper guy. Uh, that filmmaker made the doc about Dennis. Oh, oh. Along the road. Mm. Along for the ride.
Oh, that's a cool, that's a cool okay. guy to get, have gotten. That's good. Yeah, yeah, he's cool. I never worked with Hopper. I auditioned for him a couple of times, but he always gave me a hard time. Oh, yeah? He didn't like my West Texas accent. I said, just put me there, man. Two weeks, I'll grab it. Mm. You know, just like you want. But I thought I had a pretty good West. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start in with it. Don't start in giving me grief about my accent. I know. That's I know. a good low shot, you know. Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, bless his heart. He, he yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, good. Well, let me know, man, and I'll make a noise about this because I know a lot of people would be happy to to uh, see us doing something together. Okay, cool. I will. Oh. Yeah, you be well. Sure send you the the clip, my clip. Maybe not the whole show, but our little ten minute piece we'll end up doing. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. Okay. Send it. To you. Okay. You be I well. Hasta luego. Okay. <laughs>